Being a creator can sometimes be lonely and the journey is filled with uncertainty. I sometimes wish that I could ask my favorite YouTubers, writers, podcasters, and entrepreneurs how they do things, how much to charge, and what I should do next. And that's exactly what I get to do with Creators on Air. From writing, running your own business, coming up with ideas, and going viral, I hope these lessons help you on your journey too. So I remember changing my style after two weeks to this um, more conversational style that I'd started to notice doing really well on TikTok. And I thought it would be really suitable for educational videos because you can kind of have a conversation with yourself about a topic. One evening, um, I changed my style to this new conversational style. And the next day at like lunchtime, started getting a few vibrations on the phone. Um, I was like, oh, that's cool. I have a thousand views on this video. That's my best video, like by 10 times at this point. And by the next evening, it was on like 100,000 views and I was like gobsmacked. So I was like, let me try this again um, and make another video in this style and see if like I'm a one hit wonder or not. And the next one got like 30,000 views. And then the one after that got like a million maybe even views. So I was onto something. And I think those three videos combined took me to like 40, 50,000. And then over the next two, three weeks, creating daily videos went up to 100,000. I was an early adopter of this conversational style at a time when it was clearly doing very well. Now it's kind of common practice on TikTok. People know about this. There are so many people that use the same style, but it was at a time where it just worked really well. And it was almost felt like I could say anything in a conversational style and I would get tens of thousands of views because some of the content I look back at it was like awful. I was like, I wasn't sharing anything here. I didn't, I like, I didn't get to my point. These videos were far too long. There was no hook. Like what was going on when I actually analyzed them? And yet they're still sitting on hundreds of thousands of views. So that was um, definitely an element of luck and timing to it. And then I suppose if you're looking to, to grow at the same time, just do what I did. Look at a style on TikTok of kind of illustrating your point that is clearly doing well. Don't worry about the niche. So like, let's say you want to be in the educational niche, but you see an entertaining style um, that's doing really well at the moment or trends or things like that. Just develop it and make it your own and put your own spin on it. Um, because if it's not, if it's working already on TikTok, don't like change the formula. And that'll be my, my tip to get started and you'll evolve into your own style from there, but it's definitely a great, um, piece of advice to starting out. I guess niche is somewhat important, maybe not as important as understanding your audience. I think if you can understand your audience and what they want, then that's more important than niche. I think personally, I like everything in its own separate bucket. Um, interestingly enough, when I went to this finance conference and I was saying, look, I've got these, I've got these websites and I, 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 I've got this website and I want to put travel content on this finance website. A lot of them said, go for it. Um, and, and I didn't, I chose to separate the two and I'm really, really glad I did. Um, in hindsight, I'd have done far better in the pandemic if I'd have kept them both together because I'd have had two niches in one area, but I didn't like the idea of somebody coming to a travel website and me also talking about how I plan to retire early and things like that. So I think as long as you understand it from an audience perspective, that's probably the most essential. Something that I've come to believe is that most creators wait too long to start trying to like earn money. I'm not, I make a distinction between like earn a living, like go pro and just like earning anything because there was a belief in my perspective that you couldn't really like start to earn on your blog or your blog or like any of your channels until like it was time to go all in. And I kind of fell into that trap a little bit. And what I learned was that it's a big deal and there's a lot of pressure when you feel like this launch or this year needs to be the launch that gives me enough money to quit my job. And you know, so I kept waiting for like, okay, it's time for you know, you know, those success stories that I see like, all right, I had this six figure launch and I was like, I will take a fifty, twenty thousand dollar launch would be great as well. And it puts a it, I put a lot of pressure on myself. I think a lot of people put pressure on themselves when it comes to monetizing products, courses, coaching, because they're like the first one or an early one has to be the one or I'm a failure. And what I learned is that it's much more incremental than that. And so what I try and help people with and try and encourage people to do is like literally start small, like whatever, like which you think the easiest first product can be. I find for most people, especially for YouTubers, like a paid live workshop that's like $37, $47 that's focused on one specific outcome. Like I did one last year about, hey, here's how to, here's how to 
get enough ideas, create and edit your first 10 YouTube videos. So really specific. It's not like how to like, not anything huge that like what, uh, you know, how you and I met through Ali, but it's like one really specific thing. Like how can I create my first video for YouTube? And then how can I do that nine more times to get 10 videos out? And like that was an hour and a half workshop. I charged $47 and 20 people signed up and that was a thousand dollars. And I can pretty much do that or something like that every month. And I'll probably come away with like $10,000 just from doing that for an hour and a half once a month, every month. And the extension of that, that I think is, is important to realize is if I'm doing that in a live workshop, that's an hour and a half. There are lessons throughout all of that. And if I do it multiple times, I'm going to get enough feedback and enough questions from participants. That's why I like doing it live. So I get that feedback to then say like, okay, well, I'm just doing this as a 90 minute live program. I can also, I could literally take these recordings, but now I can take this and I can turn it into a course. And so now it's a $147 like self-guided course. And if I wanted to take it as, uh, if I wanted to take it past that, then I could do a six week like cohort program and say, I'm going to help you over six weeks actually do actually create these first 10 videos. And you can do that for all different kinds of topics, but that's actually a uh, process that I went through. Like I'm going to do a workshop and then I'm going to do a self-guided course. I'm going to do a cohort course. And then for everybody who'd been a customer for any one of those, I said, Hey, if you want now one-on-one -on -one coaching over the next three months, then it's this. So it's like from a $47 thing to a 500 to a thousand dollar coaching program we can go all the way up and down that scale i believe that everyone is an influencer in their own way like i really do believe everyone influences everyone whether it's online or offline so i also think that like calling myself an influencer is like what does that even mean because you can influence your family and friends off social media and um, whereas obviously not everyone is a creator I think that is a role in itself where you're actively creating content and you're curating a feed or videos or pictures or whatever it is to give a message. But I think the terms now, I use them interchangeably because like the way influencers are viewed and the role of influencers now is so different to like 10 years ago. I would say like five to 10 years ago, influencers were just given products or services and you literally just create an ad and you promote it. Whereas I think now influencers need to have a voice and stand up for so much more than just what they're selling, or at least the good ones or the people that succeed, I think, do that. And in that sense, influencers are constantly creating content. They're creating concepts. They're creating campaigns. Like So that's why I think now there isn't a huge difference between the two. And I like to use them both interchangeably. A large component of what makes a viral video is curiosity. So, you know, that's something that I've found to be a factor as like the title and the thumbnail needs to stand out on the homepage and kind of make you think, you know, what the heck is this? And want to click on the video. So you've got to have that curiosity at that point. But then you've also kind of got to have that throughout the video and it needs to deliver on that promise. And, you know, I think mystery is just such an important factor when it comes to things like TV shows and movies. But I don't think enough people kind of incorporate that into their YouTube videos especially when you want to keep people watching for as long as possible to increase retention and watch time, which as we all know, kind of is what will help the algorithm promote your video even more, which is where you're going to get the viral video. Um, I, I think having the curiosity and mystery within a video is a lot easier when it's like an entertainment video, like a Mr. Beast kind of video. Um, but I also do think that when it comes to value adding educational videos, it can be done too, as you can kind of like slowly reveal information um, that your viewers have initially clicked for. Um, for me, I think that, that those are the videos that perform well. I, I think it's kind of like, what is this? It's answering a question for me. You're clicking onto it. You're trying to discover what's happening. You want to see what that payoff is going to be at the end of the video. And I think if you have th that as a whole, it not only helps from an algorithm perspective, but I think it also helps from like a storytelling perspective. And you as a viewer then want to share it with friends and family. And that's kind of like how videos can then become viral. I would probably say there are two core things which I try to try to aim when I make my visuals and always try to 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 do them which is one of them is like being very clear what are you trying to say you know being very clear about what type of emotion are you trying to evoke what type of idea are you communicating often when you try to communicate too much in one visual it will like reduce the clarity because mm, 
I really like this line. There is a guy, a big marketing guy, a guy, I think his name is Donald Miller, and he have this quote, not quote, but, but, but his idea is that when you create ads for companies, what you need to imagine is that people, when they read your ad, they are kind of burning calories while they are doing. And what you want to, you want to get your point across like as fast as possible. So they burn, burn at the least amount of calories while, while they do it. And I really like this idea. That's something I always try to keep in mind. So one, one thing is just speed. And the second thing is clarity, you know, and that clarity can work in various different formats, but it's usually you might try to communicate too much and then you need to like break it down into more simplicity or just you are being maybe off the, an off like common thing which happens I'm, I'm trying to be too clever you know being just like you are really in the zone and you're doing your thing and then you just come come across too clever because because i don't know you have thought about that idea too much so it's very important to use like simple words and very understandable phrases um so yeah, that's a that's a like ramble on this, but those are two key elements I try always to to aim. If if you if you fail at clarity, then it's then it's bad. If you fail at speed, you know, speed is not always essential, you know, because there are examples for example like uh, wait but why, which probably most people know and he often have these very elaborate and complicated messages, but most people tune in because they are very interesting ideas. So so the speed is like that's kind of my my style, my thing, you know, uh, but, uh, but clarity is very important as well. And then s s I would say speed is very important, especially if you are a young newbie creator and your credibility is quite low. Like if you want to stand out, if you want to get engagement and so on, and if you want people to pay attention, you need to be like super fast with your ideas because then like, whatever, even if you have low credibility, people will pay attention because you can deliver something, them wasting like two seconds from their day. So, so it's fine. Start with thinking about what the transformation is going to be. So what, what can you promise people will be able to do differently by the end of it? And the more specific you can get on that, the better. Um, and it's also, and I suppose the other thing is it's, it's, it needs to be specific, but also it needs to be a benefit to the person that, that you're teaching, the group of people you're teaching. Not, you know, I will teach you how to use X, Y, Z. It, it's... I will, you know, it's, it's, it's not like I will teach you how to use Notion. It'll it'll be like I teach you how to, I will teach you how to, you know, effectively manage your task list. And then mm -hmm. it happens to be using Notion, right? But like the thing that people are most interested in is how to be more productive, how to, you know, find more time in their day to spend time with their family. Like those are the things people are signing up for. And so that's the transformation. And then the, the, the other thing is the vehicle for transformation. So then it's like, okay, we have a system in Notion. I'm going to teach you this system or whatever that, that case may be. So thinking about your, your transformation and then your vehicle for transformation is a great starting point. Once people, so now you've got your North Star, right? That's like the, the transformation. Um, you want to then sort of map the journey of like step-by-step step how it's going to happen. And here's where like those questions that we talked about are, are super helpful, right? That beginner's mindset that you can get from your audience. Like what do people struggle with? So is it, like using the notion example again is it like figuring out notion like understanding databases or or is that okay that's already assumed then we can move on to more advanced stuff like sort of knowing where people start from is key in fact that's actually like a learning principle of prior knowledge is the, one of the most important inputs into designing a learning program so know where people are starting from and then map out that journey and so you've got like point a where they're coming in from and point b is that transformation and you've got to like try and fill in as much detail in the gaps between without falling to the trap of sort of expert curse, like, you know, jumping to conclusions or, or making assumptions that are not explicit and that kind of thing. I guess at the beginning, I knew that I wasn't going to reach out to the likes of, you know, a, a Thomas Frank and Ali Abdal, a Matt Diavella right at the beginning. Like those emails are going nowhere. Those messages are going nowhere. I haven't even got a channel at this point, right? I, it's like, there is no point in reaching out to those people. Um, so for me, it was a, ca a case of building my experience and therefore just interviewing people around me. So I had at least 10, 15, 20 episodes under my belt to say, hey, one, I'm definitely sure that I want to do this, right? I actually want to continue because there's that whole stat of like people get as far as seven episodes or something like this. Seventh episode is the death episode. And if you don't make it past that, then people are likely to quit. So I was like, okay, I need to make sure that this is something I actually want to do and enjoy. Uh, so I needed to get that. But also I needed to have some kind of a backlog to say, hey, I am serious. I am putting the effort in and you can see the stuff that I'm doing. And hopefully that looks good enough 
for you to even consider it. But even then, you still don't go out to the top people. You kind of level up slowly. So once you start getting some people saying yes, it's just a case of, okay, who else can I reach out to that isn't like, you know, millions of subscribers, but is still a step up. And I was incredibly lucky to get some guests on at the, like right early that said yes to me. And I still aren't, I'm not, I'm not entirely sure why they said yes to me, but I'm incredibly grateful. Uh, but honestly, it was just an email. It was, it was no different. I was genuinely fans of these people and I loved their content. And I guess that came across in the email because I was like, I, I, like, I love your stuff. I love all the stuff that you do and what you're about. And then I was just honest. I was like, look, I have a teeny tiny podcast. I'm a nobody. I totally have zero expectations. It's so cool if you don't want to do this. But on the off chance, you know, you're bored for an hour or you have nothing to do. I would love for you to come on and here's my plan. Like it wasn't just a come and chat to me about random crap for an hour. I don't know what I'm doing. It was like, look, here's what I want to talk to you about. Here's what my podcast is about. And here's what I'm trying to get across to people. And obviously that evolved over time. And I'm still like reiterating that, but I still had a plan. Um, and yeah, so some of the earlier, like I got Tom Buck on who like, is now a friend and is just is a wonderful person. But he said it was the email that made the difference. And the fact that I had a plan because he had like people emailing him all the time, but there was something behind that that made him go, actually, yes, I want to do this. Um, and that was cool. And obviously, once you start getting small, like wins like that, and you start getting people coming on, it's easier for the next person to say yes, because you can then say, hey, I've had X, Y, and Z on. Uh, and then, yeah, Marie Poulin, another one of my absolute favorites. Again, no idea why she said yes, but I'm so incredibly <laughs> grateful. And those start making a difference, because then people can see, and you can turn around and say, look, I've had these people on. Um, so yeah, that, that's kind of how it started. With regards to social media, the key is you just need to be one step ahead. If you show that willingness to learn, it doesn't matter if you've got, you know, a really high class master's degree or you haven't even done your GCSEs yet. It doesn't matter because what matters is that you're just one step ahead. You have that little bit of knowledge. And if you're constantly educating yourself, stuff in society is always changing. And, you know, often nowadays it goes back to the to the old saying that the youth actually know quite a lot that older people don't know anymore. And it's come to kind of part of my job now where I teach older people in businesses how to do TikTok. I consult, I make videos for them because they're going to the younger generation now about their expertise. Um, but the key is, you know, don't don't let the fact that you're not an expert hold you back, because really, I'm not the ex I'm not an expert with money, but I I have educated myself. I have looked into it. There are tons of people on TikTok that know way more about, about money. They're financial advisors. All of my stuff, none of it's financial advice. It's just suggestions, tips, hints. Um, but but really, yeah, I, I, know, I know enough about the algorithm that means, you know, I'm able to do 10 times better than someone that might have 10 times more knowledge than me. The key is being able to understand the algorithm and present stuff uh, to your target audience in a way that will appeal to them. And I think, you know, a lot of the stuff that I talk about as well is ways to get ahead in life. And some of that stuff is aimed towards younger people. I might talk about, you know, when can you legally vape? All right, that's a one that people wanna know, but what are the health risks involved with vaping? Or when can you get a car? How do you get a car? People sometimes do prefer to hear it from someone who's their own age, who can relate to them. Um, Always think about with social media, what everyone has a USP, a unique selling point that can make them different. For example, uh, I'm friends with a guy called Mark Tilbury. He's got like 7 million followers on TikTok uh, and he's, yeah, he's killing it, right? His USP is the fact that he's, a, he's an older guy. He's like nearly 60 probably. And um, for him, it's his expertise. He's, he's been in the game for a long time now. Um, so that's his USP. It makes people stop. For me, it's that I'm young, so I play that to my advantage. Everyone has has you know an unfair advantage. That's what you call it. Use your unfair advantage. Get out there and present your unfair advantage on social media. Yeah, I think the mindset is like, what platforms are you already using? Because if you don't use TikTok and it it's going to be a whole new platform to understand and to to start to spend time on and to understand the trends, that just seems harder that just seems like you're you're basically running uphill um so I, I always ask myself like what would be running uphill or what would be running downhill which is like an extension to tim ferris saying like if this was easy how would it look so if you don't spend any time on tiktok and you don't currently uh film video content you're you're a, you're a writer as you say like you have a newsletter you, that's easy for you to sit down and, and write um 
realize that about yourself. That's not the same for everyone. So clearly you should be aligning the art of writing with uh, a platform with high organic reach. So it's almost like step one, like if you uh, like to talk and communicate, then that's audio. If you like to be on camera and that comes easy to you, that's video. Um, and then if it's writing. So it's like pick one out of that. That's like step one, pick one of those three. Step two, align that with a platform with high organic reach. So if you have a newsletter with 200 subscribers, um, your long form writing may not get the, may not be successfully distributed on uh, just posting a newsletter each week. Maybe you take writing and you go to step two and go, okay, so LinkedIn, if I, LinkedIn has high organic reach right now, I'm gonna post my long form writing as text posts every day. That makes a lot more sense. So you're taking what works naturally for you, which is uh, sort of running downhill. It feels like it takes no effort at all. You're pairing it with a platform which has high organic reach. And there's one for, for visuals, there's one for um, audio, there's one for writing. And then that just makes a lot more sense. That sounds to me like it doesn't take too much time and you're pairing it with the right platform for you. Um, if you like to write and you're thinking pressured to do TikToks, there's a mismatch. Um, there's a mismatch there. That's not going to work well. Even if you, you post it daily for a week, you're not going to you know, be consistent as we all know is, is the thing that actually makes a difference in the long run. Firstly, something that I did, which was a huge like upper for me was I ditched reading self-help books at nauseam and switched out to fiction. So going, I used to love reading fiction as a kid and I kind of gave that up because I convinced myself that I had to be productive at all times. Don't get me wrong. Self-help books are great. Some of them have changed my life, but when you are able to immerse yourself in a storyline and see the craft of writing and its full potential, there's nothing more inspiring than that. You can also take phrases or sentences that are beautiful and stand out to you. You can write them down and refer to them later in your writing. And again, there's literally nothing more inspirational as a writer than seeing beautiful writing and being like, oh my gosh, I want to try and do that too. I would say secondly, your biggest competitive advantage as a creator, as a writer, etc., is your personal voice. It's knowing what makes you you, your opinions, your standpoint, your quality of thinking. You will not be able to know what any of that is if you don't listen to yourself. And you can do that in multiple ways. You can meditate, you can journal, um, any other creative activities. But so something that I try and do every single morning are morning pages where I just write any thoughts, any stream of consciousness. And it might seem kind of trivial, but that habit has helped me become close to myself. And when I'm closer to myself, I know my voice better versus consuming social media and letting other people's thoughts and ideas penetrate my psyche. Think about who are the people you are currently serving because you are serving people with your content in some capacity. Uh, what are the problems that they have? And what are the problems that they would pay to have solved? This is why I don't really like targeting students because students don't have money and don't want to pay for stuff. I also don't really like targeting like junior doctors, for example, who famously don't have money and don't want to pay for stuff. But targeting business owners is amazing. If you target business owners and you can solve a problem that they have, they're likely to be willing to pay for it. And so they're likely to pay for your thing. You can do a Grace Beverly and you know she's not selling to businesses, she's selling to individuals. And she knows that their problem is that they wanted, or back in the day, they wanted workout plans because they kept asking her for it. And so she made a PDF, sold it for a fiver initially, and people bought it. It's like. Essentially, money is an exchange of value and you make money by solving a problem that someone has that they're willing to pay money to have solved. And I think most creators don't actually speak to their audience or have any, like people are like, oh, I don't really know my audience. It's like, oh, 80, 17 to 86, like from all these different countries. Um, we recently hired this agency to literally uh, do a sort of 20 minute survey for like 2000 of our audience members and hop on calls with like 50 of them to get some insights as to who are the people who are watching our stuff? What do they want? And what are the problems that we can then solve for them? A, with our free content, but B, with our paid stuff. And I think really it's just about getting into the mind of your customer, which involves speaking to them. And the nice thing about being a creator is that if you have any kind of following, if you were, for example, to post on your Instagram story or Twitter, be like, hey, would love to hop on a Zoom call with 20 of my of people who watch my videos just to ask you a bit more about yourself, you'd find loads of stuff, loads of problems that people have, which would A, give you loads of content ideas and also give you ideas for products that you could potentially make. That's actually a good idea. I think I might do that. Yeah, that's what we do for our courses. We hop on Zoom calls with people and be like, what are all your problems? We write them all down. We're like, right, let's make sure every lesson solves one of these problems. Thank you for joining me on Creators on Air. Season two will be launching soon with more of your favorite creators. In the meantime, if you are a creator, check out Passion Fruit. We help you to manage sponsorships, collaborations, and payments all in one place. I'll see you soon.